Mike Fonseca right. It's Black History Month, brother. <laughs> you guys all ready? <laughs> Valentine's Day. Valentine's <laughs> Day. Three, two, one. Welcome to What's Your Name Again. This is Kirk Caceres, your host, and I have with me today, I have Travis Aaron Wade once again, coming in from miles and miles and, and hours away as usual. Being a trooper, man, he this guy comes through all the time, and, and he's always on time too. What do you what do you use, Waze or MapQuest or uh, what is, what is it? What Google Maps? Google Maps. And you're always on time. I'm always on time. So thank you, Travis, for being here. And we have now this. This was a shock. This is an unexpected. I threw it out there, just threw the bait, and she bit. And I'm so thankful for that she came. <laughs> Our recent guest. You know, just from a week or two ago, Jade Albany Pietrantonio is Thank here. You. Did I say it right? Yeah. <laughs> well done. You just I, been practicing. Dude, I practiced so much. I was like, I can't butcher <laughs> it. Her name is so hard to pronounce, and that was, that was pretty close. That was very good. So thank you for coming and being here. This is awesome. The two of you across from me co-hosting. I love this. He's making out with the dog. And he's just kissing. Day. Can you see the dog on camera? Yeah. This, is, this is Chewy. Chewy Poo. Oh, there's Chewy. Chewy Poo. That's cute. <laughs> I love it because multiple people have brought their dogs on, into the studio. Yeah, it's a dog, dog we had Yoda here once. Um, Yoda, now we have Chewy. Now we have Chewy. I'll bring Leia next time. <laughs> and Jedi. <laughs> exactly. And speaking of uh, Travis, so we're here today because we have a another friend of Travis's that came in. This guy, I just met him. He came early, which is great because we actually, I usually don't get a chance to, to meet the guests too much early and talk, just the two of us. Noah Huntley is here. He came in. From Culver City, well, the, I actually had pulled up, and this car was behind me. I'm like, who the hell is this dude? He jumped out of the car, <laughs> jumped out of the Uber, and he showed up. And he's like, hey, what's up? Look, can I help you? And what's up? And he's here. So Noah Huntley's here. What's up? There what's going is. on? Like a homeless guy off the streets. <laughs> and so I was like, it was an Uber. <laughs> or was it a friend dropped him off? He <laughs> offered to help. <laughs> exactly. How was the traffic getting in here? It was good. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Coming I mean, from. I get up early because, well, not as early as these guys, actually. But I get up early because England's like at the end of the day in the morning here. So I'm like doing England stuff and then it's in the LA stuff. Yeah, this guy, uh, he's on two, two different time zones. Yeah. I came in from England, really. For yeah. The yeah, he actually flew yeah. in for this and yeah. he's going to fly back out again yeah. to the other side. And so, kicked out what, what time is it in England when you're just starting your day here? They're eight, eight hours ahead. Eight so, hours ahead. So around seven here is like three in the afternoon. You get two good hours while everyone's in the office. And yeah. Then, and then they're winding down. Oh, perfect. So, and so so for those listening, his name is Noah Cornelius Marmaduke Huntley. Is that correct? Yeah, we don't have to get caught up in that. <laughs> but, but, uh, but oh, I do. because Oh, but oh, I do. I do. Because as an American, our names are John Smith. You know, Steve Sabo. I mean, I they're feel just like Cornelius is actually more American than his English. No one's called Cornelius. I'm, but but the name is amazing. It's you have four names and they sound so distinguished, like a distinguished gentleman. Like you just, it's just. I know. <laughs> and you're from West Sussex, England. Noah Cornelius Marmaduke Huntley. And check this out. So he also was educated, which I found at Windlesham House School in Poolborough. And Leighton Park School in Berkshire, <laughs> and Our I'm Lady. Gonna I'm gonna have to redo all of this. <laughs> you have to understand, most yeah. Americans don't have that kind of but that's education. What, exactly. <laughs> so now I'll translate. That's Windlesham House School in Poolborough, <laughs> <laughs> Leighton Park School in Reading, Berkshire. And and what's the last one? Our Lady of Sion School in. Yeah, Our Lady of Science School in Worthing, West Sussex. Okay, so that's and that's where I wanted to go because in Americans we have West Pico. Yeah. Right. Or we have South Central High. Chapman. Yeah. yeah. You know, we don't have... Kawanga and Sepulveda and, and that's why sounding I'm, names. Exactly. And that's why yeah. I was so amazed. Like, I hear these names. I'm like, it's so different than what, what I'm used to here. I was born and raised in the States, and uh, our names are basic. Like yeah. that. Do you guys have mascots at your schools? Like... Like, no, we just have history, you know, and, and over the years, these <laughs> things evolve. They get more complicated. <laughs> See, <laughs> we don't need owls. We don't need owls. We have mascots. I mean, they're optional. <laughs> exactly. We have education. Since Because we don't have history here, we have to replace it with mascots. Yeah, and cheerleaders. You need a bit more encouragement. We have mad nuns. Yeah. <laughs> oh, mad nuns, nuns, exactly. That'd be a great name for a school, the mad nuns. <laughs> What was your, what was the school your name your school's names when you were uh, Jade? Uh, I went to a Rudolf Steiner school. So what, how did what was that's that? a Waldorf school? A Waldorf over here, school by the way. over there. Yeah, I went to it's a it's a school for hippies. 
Um, it was great. Fantastic. And then I went to Oxley College. Oxley College? Yeah. When I decided to be a normal human for a second. But my brother went to school in England in uh, Egham. And oh, uh, the Royal Holloway School. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it was so interesting being there, though, because you get on the bus and it's like Tottingham, Beckingham, Eggham. And then there was a place just called Ham. Yeah. Just ham. That's right. Ran out of ideas. Yeah. Ham. They used to What's be with that? Pig settlements. Oh, wait, yeah. actually? Yeah, they used to trade pigs in yeah. Roman times. Speaking of which, you did. <laughs> Noah, you grew up on a farm. Did you grow up on a farm? Yeah, no pigs. No no pigs? Just what did my you have? Family. <laughs> oh, just. Well, we were this always guy. at the trough. <laughs> oh, no. We, is this English humor? <laughs> Spe- so speaking of which, <laughs> this guy, speaking of his family, you're one of eight eight children. And there's a fact. And and yeah. and and check out these even more facts. You're a twin, <laughs> and his homework. sister's name is Echo, <gasps> which is an awesome name. That's a dope name. But I think also like the the I- irony of Echo being a twin, like you know, repeating. Uh, well, how amazing! I'm is glad that? you picked up on that. Someone else went, "Oh, after the Greek myth, Echo and Narcissus." I was like, <laughs> "No, no one." No. Well, that would make me Narcissus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> obviously, that's not right. It's not. That's not yeah. Correct. So uh, yeah, but Push no, on Echo's better. She was actually first. Oh. It, Damn, so know, she's older. Time travel. Does she use that against Echo. you? <laughs> Does she always use that against you that she's older? Like she has, to, you have to do what she says. Well, there are t- there's there's more above us. So, no, that's you know, what I was going to say. If we get into that, it just never ends. Okay, let's check this out. There's more twins. Yeah, he's what? one of three sets of twins and eight that. children. Yeah. So there's an echo on the echo on the echo. <laughs> How <laughs> freaking explain. crazy is that? Twice. Exactly. You should see the looks. For those of you not watching this, wow. Travis's and Jade's faces were like, "What?" Yeah, Travis is like, well, I've known, this I've guy known him over for a fifteen decade. years. He's one of three sets of twins in a family of eight kids. I didn't know okay, that. Okay, explain the tree. I got, I got to know. <clears throat> yeah. So, well, so and then there are two singles. Let's not leave them out because they <laughs> they pair up because they feel. But they're not odd. cool because they're, they're not, not twins. twins. Yeah. Well, they that's why they pair up because they feel ostracized <laughs> and like they're outcasts. We're all outcasts is the reality, but we don't tell them that. So yeah, they pair, they gang up, and then there are four lots of two, and we all just kind of take the and you all meet at the trough, and then we put on our uh, like cross suits on, and we go at it. <laughs> are they all all same parents? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, mum produced a lot of eggs, and dad so produced so a lot so, of swimmers. so the gene wow. runs strong in that family. Yeah, it is the twin. Us. That is very strong. Yeah, that's amazing. I've never heard of something like that. It's crazy. What? Yeah, there's been like a government program now. They've taken our DNA and they're <laughs> injecting it into <laughs> mammoths. Yeah. So, is there like a probability that you're going to have twins? Like, is that a? I think we're basically for all fraternal. So I think that skips a generation. If you're identical, as in same egg that splits rather than two eggs, then it's then it carries on maybe the next generation. But we skip. Apparently. You skip a generation. Yeah. Wow. So there'll there'll be relief. Apparently. There you go. So for those of you who don't know Noah, this guy he was on he was in the Snow White and the Huntsman. I was that that was uh, how how was that how was that uh, experience? Um, it was good. I was I was Snow White's father, King White, uh-huh. uh, King Magnus. So I was and yeah, I lasted for about ten minutes on that one, and then Charlize Theron murders me in our <laughs> marriage bed. You know there are worse ways to go. Yes. Yeah, there, there was much worse ways to go. And you were in the Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, one of the didn't, classic. Couldn't technically die on that. Went back into a wardrobe, turned into a child. Uh huh. Yeah. And then You're catching you, the theme here. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's good not to die. Kill no one. My friends always tell costs. me. My friends always joke with me. They're always like, "Dude, you always die. You're always freaking dying." You too. Yeah, they they say that. Yeah. Well, they yeah, always say likewise. it's good to be king. Yeah. But Noah's constantly king, king and he's for a always day. constantly killed. So I don't know if that, that statement is true for King for, for a day, Trap. King That's what it is. What Except it is. in my case, half a day. Half a day. <laughs> <laughs> but the trouble I cause in that twelve hours is extraordinary. It's lifetime. It's 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 a memorable one. But you but these are amazing projects though. These are like Yeah. You know, in the Royals, you were in the I did some episodes in the Royals. I'm Elizabeth Hurley's true love in I the mean, Royals. Freaking amazing, dude. Yeah, Look at like that. that. <laughs> but what most people no, and he and intern Juan was tripping out over this because everyone loves Twenty Eight Days Later, right? Yep. How now? How was it shooting that crazy chaotic of a film? Oh well, it was great because I was one of the two survivors that ends up picking up Killian and showing him how it's all gone wrong. And, yeah. Uh, then I get killed. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he's died. There's a, there's another death. But that was a freaking amazing movie. You guys, did you guys see Twenty Eight Days Later? Of course, yeah. Do you, do you guys remember that? 
That'd be seriously. End of the world. That w- that Jade? I, I, I haven't seen that. I'm sorry. Great, great. I will go home it's, and watch it ASAP. I've well, seen everything else. Just it, not that one. I mean, not for me, but you should watch it for Killian because it was kind of, it was Killian's movie before he became Killian Murphy and did every Batman film and Inception and whatever else. He, yeah, it was like a, an end of the world type of like, was what was it? A plague? It or was what like a hell? zombie apocalypse. Yeah. yeah. It's a but it was intense. But the way they, they shot it was actually very intense. It was intense. The freaking music and the style of shooting it was, well, it, was, it was it was Danny Boyle kind of at the height of what Danny Boyle was doing as well and yeah. he continues to be brilliant but he's he it was it was it's him really he's an extraordinary director mm. and then right now then you just got congratulations and I guess in October you got renewed for second season yeah. on Pandora yeah you Thank played you. Donovan Osborne it's on the CW yeah so that's when you guys start up pretty soon. What's what's your character and what's the storyline on that? Yeah, I mean, it, so Pandora for the CW and we're second season and I'm kind of a Lord Asriel type character from Dark Materials. Oh, okay, You've okay. The, the for the well, people stuff. listening, I'm sure some people will know yeah. that. There's a, he's sort of a mysterious character. You're never quite sure whether he's good or bad, and but he's a badass. And uh, But he's the head of this academy for gifted students in the future, 150 years in the future. Oh, nice. We've colonized outer planets and he's also embedded into the eis the earth intelligence service now do you do that in your normal accent do, you, do they want to, you? i get to do my you accent. get to be well, you it's not really me it's me being patrick stewart but yeah it's 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 near yeah. enough me exactly because it's based kind of like like off the x-men kind of concept I mean, a little I, bit they I stole mean, it i never really i never watched any x-men films but yeah. i feel like the 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 sci-fi nerds that i'm working with are like deeply embedded in all that yeah and how often do you do you change? Do you have to put on the American accent for things? Is that some of the roles you played? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, you know, a few times. Uh-huh. Um, I'm trying to remember what I've done in American accent. Probably nothing anyone's seen. As but. the little fluffy dog rubs up against your ankles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that feels like <laughs> the knows extension of Travis. Let's <laughs> hear Hi, it. Travis. I sent him Let's over hear to the you. American accent. Oh, no, you're not hearing you, it. No, no. The, they I, made, I, they I made Jade... It. Your next question has to be answered. Greg made... W- one of our other co-hosts made her go into the American I'm accent. really? Sucker. <laughs> I wasn't going to do that, and you fell for it. I, I wasn't going to expect that. She's like, hey, okay. I did it. I did it. Come on. I need, a, I need like a week. Come on, prepare. Cornelius. <laughs> now, was was any of your family, were like, were your parents like actors or entertainers or anyone in your family like in, in the arts when well, you were younger? Well, dad's half Irish, so I feel like the Irish is just all natural entertainment. They're always just performing, right? Yeah. I mean, they, somewhere between the conflict, they, they are performers <laughs> too. So it's... it's uh, I think that's in the blood, but ma- it, seriously, mum, mum, mum was uh, in te- doing textiles and weaving in at art school, and then she met dad, and then they started having twins, and then her <laughs> hobby, biz- her hobby from art school was making stockings, natural fiber stockings, silk, cotton, and wool, lots of colors, sort of Mary Quant in the sixties, a bit punk, but but classy punk, and. They provide stockings and legwear to the film industry the whole time. Wow. So whether it's, you know, they just do everything. I just love some of these terms, textiles and weaving yeah. and stockings. Yeah, like, not, yeah. But would you ever imagine somebody <laughs> doing weaving or textiles? You know, no, it's that. Well, my family's British, so I've heard these terms before. Oh, okay. So they're more familiar we're, to we're you. We're very similar in the sense that uh, my background is Irish English. Is that not an American thing? No, you would never use the term textiles, textiles. or weaving. Mm-hmm. It's almost a joke, you know, someone would say, oh, what do you, what do you do? Do you weave? Do you sew? Do you, you know, it's just not right. something. And I love hearing these terms because it's actually. It's real work. It's real work and it's real words. It's, you know, it's how you should pronounce some of these terms. So did you do theater growing up at all? Did you do any theater? Or how did you get into acting? Yeah. Because well, we I, always imagine British people, everyone does theater. Like well, that's just. It's part of the Pedigree. But, but it, in a way, I mean, outside of LA, because LA is all sort of screen really um, feels like. But um, so I came out here when I was 30. I started acting when I was 11. And I went to theater school because we were educated at home. And um, well, we, but we weren't really. <laughs> so we didn't do very much at home for, for a year in my case. And then the education officer said, right, we're going to send these children to care. They seem very bright, but they're also reckless. Like, this is mad. Uh-huh. So dad uh, was so offended by the local schools because they were very not very intelligent and he said I, I feel bad sending my children to these schools it's it's going to destroy them and their natural intelligence so he found a theater school in inverted commas that was kind of like a a, a, a correctional facility 
for all the awkward children. And there were 20 pupils and it was run from someone's house in a sort of provincial oh. town in England. So it was... But it was a theatre school, but a correctional facility. A, a th- yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, exactly, yeah. Almost opposite. You so. got it. <laughs> We're um, gonna. We, we want you to be an, an artist. You're an interesting human, aren't you? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm you. Right? <laughs> this is one of my Tell favorites. Me more. Travis, Tell me more. Travis is, Travis is over there. Yeah, look what we brought into this. <laughs> I love Noah. <laughs> this guy, you are an interesting... Keep talking. I want to know more. I mean, there's plenty more. So so I went there for a year and a half, and I, I never felt good in a leotard, and uh, <laughs> tap dancing was never going to be my thing. But I did enjoy watching the mainly girl population. <laughs> Uh, get ready to do performances of cabaret and fishnets and top hats. I guess I was about 13, so I was just coming into my adolescence. Yeah. So that was all quite magical. Um, and then I, I, kept, I got an agent. I got an agent because someone thought I was useful at something. And uh, <laughs> I did musical theatre and commercials for a few years as a young sort of freckly kid. Yeah. And then when I was 19, I started... I, you know, I got a TV series for two years, and that's I realized, oh, I'm actually a professional actor. Yeah, and I, I, I saw somewhere that you did a lot, some modeling too, right? How that, old were you when you started that? Way later. That came that, later. Yeah, that came like. Well, I mean, you yeah. got for for Hollywood, you got a super late start to get here at thirty. Mm. Like that rarely. That's that's considered old. I know to I get was, started. I was busy. <laughs> you know I was, what I mean? I was so busy back in Europe, and then so, but then there was an opening. But no, I'm yeah. I mean, you're right. I, I mean, that's admirable that you got to start that late, late, and you've had success. Yeah. I mean, good, good for you. So what what did you do when you got here at thirty, and you just hit the ground running, or what? Were, what are I some of the Travis. <laughs> he met me. You met pretty quickly. We met right yeah. away. Yeah. Oh, did you? I, I was telling you in the kitchen that uh, Noah went to my first premiere with me. Oh, so okay. When I did a, a film where I was the star of a movie, the first time I was ever a star of a film, the only time I was a star of a film. <laughs> um, what do you mean? We did the film we met on. You were the star. Well, I mean, of a film, you know, that got released that, that in the theaters. Was good. That well, you know, our film was good. <laughs> it was good. It's just but no, I mean, in, in an actual major you. motion picture, which is, I, I just had this conversation recently with a friend of mine um, about the, the recent film I did, and that Sebastian Stan was number one on the call sheet. And I said, holy, it's the first time in his career that he's been number one on a yeah. call sheet, which is essentially the movie star. When you think about, you know, there's movie stars, but to be a movie star, you really have to be number one on the call sheet at some point in some film. That's, And I've always said Sebastian was a movie star before he was the movie star. Yeah. He, he became very famous and very successful, um, you know, in his career doing the, the Avengers, but he was like number five on the call sheet, number seven on the call sheet. You know, you had Samuel Jackson, you had all these people ahead of him. So it was really my first time ever being number one on the call sheet, and the movie was my billing. And uh, Noah and I, Noah and I, had just met, and I said, "Do you want to go to a movie premiere with me?" And me, him, and Taylor Kinney ended up going together <laughs> to my movie premiere, and it was like rock star time. That's awesome. Yeah, we were stars. drinking champagne. Rock we went stars limo. with pedicures. Yeah, we had, we had, we had, we looked, we looked, we looked the part. And had you only up. been here, how long had you been in town at, when you went to that? I really can't remember. I mean, I can't remember. I'm, I'm going it was to very soon. Months, a year. Yeah, maybe, you're, maybe, I'm, yeah. you're already, I'm, I'm here and I'm going to a Hollywood premiere. Oh my God. And Travis is, ha- we're having massages and pedicures. Like, this is Hollywood. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, well. You're riding back home to your parents on the farm. This is what yeah. I'm doing now. Yeah. And the movie was called we're Pig clean Hunt. now. <laughs> That's a real story. The movie was called Pig Hunt. And he's like, I've come to LA to go to a movie premiere. I've left the farm to go to a movie premiere called Pig Hunt. Yeah, I've That's arrived. Awesome. I've arrived. I've gone so full circle. <laughs> and so for those of you who don't know, who um, who are listening or watching, a call, a call sheet, because we come sometimes take for granted people know. A call sheet basically is a list of many, a lot of information, but it kind of tells you what time you need to be at work, kind of tells you information like location, who's the director. But the call sheet part that Travis is talking about is there's an order of the cast from 1 to 50, whatever. And it goes in order of importance, yep. you know, kind of your, your part in the project, how big your role is, and importance. Usually the main star is number one, and it goes down from there. So I think the highest I've ever made on a call sheet was five. Yeah, it's a big deal. Five or six. I didn't realize what a big deal it was. It's a big deal. Like it's a thing. How about you, Jade? What's the highest you've ever been on a call sheet? I think it was on the right stuff, which was I think I was like eight. Yeah, seven. And that's good. If you're top ten, that's good. And you know, especially in an ensemble cast, Mm. you know, you're in there. You were one in that one. In Pig Hunt, yeah. There you go. And it's it's the fix was one, but that was a short film. But, but, but actually, Robert excuse Patrick, me, Robert was, Patrick was one. Yeah, I Robert was Patrick. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah, I wasn't even on the fix number one. 
to correct that. But it, it really, um, and we talked a lot about this back in the day. It's been a while, but the responsibility that comes with being number one on the call sheet means that you set the tone along with the director mm. and that your behavior trickles down to people are watching you. I mean, you're in front of everybody all day. They're lighting around you. The attention's on you. Mm. And so everyone's kind of dictating the day based on you. And if you come up every day, like kind of in a bad mood or just not nice, it trickles down. That's very true. The director and the, you and the, the director, star, yes. the director and the star of the show. If those two people are not in sync and not putting out a good vibe or good energy that you, you see it in the rest of the production. Yeah. You, you feel it. Yeah. So, you know, we talked a lot about that cause that was 15 years ago. And, um, I remember just sitting there going like, what a, what a huge responsibility to have, you know, that many people looking at you to decide how the day goes. And then Liam Neeson, I met a friend who was working with him and, uh, he said, you know, the problem about being a, a star is, as a, as a young actor that's not a star, you can walk in the shadows and you can observe life. And then what we do is represent life. He said, the problem with being a star is you've got this bright light of stardom shining in your eyes and you can't see anything. You're mm. blinded by it. And you're certainly not able to look out and see anything with an objective point of view because everyone's looking at you. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, and the, and the, that was the other thing that, that Liam was saying was once you've turned on stardom, you can't Turn switch it off. It off. We go, yeah. oh, I can have a day off today. No. It's on. Yeah, unless you quit the business for a while and disappear mm. and, and stop working. Mm. That's the only way to do it. Yep. But usually but it's a catch-22. you still come 22. back and be the guy who took some time off. off. <laughs> you're still that guy or you're still that guy or girl from... I think you that know. happens a lot in fantasy, right? Like, I, I mean, I always use Daniel Radcliffe as a... As a you know, the the benchmark, but like once you are Harry Potter or once you are something that, especially in fantasy where people just are like, you are that for, for all the comic cons and everything. It's very hard to be like, why is Harry Potter in a romantic comedy? You know, that's like so true. That's, I cannot watch him. And there's like a new comedy show that he's got coming out at the moment. And my brain is just so confused because he's so iconic as Harry Potter. Mm. So I, yeah, that's must, very true. Especially the fantasy medieval genre, it's hard to break out because you've created this fantasy character that's not based off reality. Yeah, and, and then the whole world sees you as that, and it's so hard to see them. Yeah, as especially that. if you're unknown before you do a fantasy. Like, have you found that your fans with the like as the show's been growing, they're quite intense fantasy fans, right? Yeah, but thank God my character is so dark. <laughs> that um, I've managed to avoid it all. In fact, I was meant to go to Comic-Con, there were complications, I didn't turn up, so it was just an empty seat, which I was like, <laughs> that's kind of what my character would do anyway. <laughs> oh, you didn't make it. You're like a evil character, or like... It's just somebody who doesn't... He, he makes the rules, he doesn't play by the rules. So, right. So, so it was great that there was an empty seat. A narcissist? <laughs> Usually there's an element of narcissism in some of my roles, yeah. But do you have anti-fans? Like, the people think that you're that character and are like, you're evil, you're mean, stop being mean to the main yeah, characters. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think so. I think yeah. they're like, oh, we don't really like you. And I'm like, that's fine, that's good. No, that's worth Right, it. okay. Yeah. <laughs> because people find it hard to separate the character from... Uh, Especially in would, fantasy. That was the other thing about dying, was they said the only way that, peop- that the audience disengages from your character is if you die. Oh. Because then psychologically they, go, they stop You're investing dead. in you. Yeah. Right. That's so true. Oh, that's interesting. That's so true because that. my, my biggest hiccup in the parts that I've played is the one that caused me the most um, problems, the ones, the ones I lived in. That's so true. The, mm. one, the one I lived, it's just like he's still alive. So. And I mean, yeah. you had Where's that, the at? crazy fantasy fan syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, that I was that. that was huge for Travis's career. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't die, and that's funny you said that because yeah, I should probably ask. I should. Probably I never call thought the CW about that. That's very interesting. And say, can you guys yeah, bring me you. back one episode and just kill my guy? Just, just CGI him. Really me. Just way. Put him in. Just, just, just that's take it. him out. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's please. better to die than to fade away. I remember getting some trophy after whatever. Isn't that? Like, isn't that? Isn't, isn't that a Def Leppard line? It probably is. It is a Def Leppard line. It's better to die. Then fade, fade away. away. Is that from a Def Leppard song? Or it, better to burn. Is or is it, it better to burn, burn than fade away? I burned for a, like six years. But Def Leppard's British. Come on, don't you guys know that stuff? I don't know. I, I'm, <laughs> just, I'm, I'm, I'm like not even name, on this world most of the time. So. Was Def Leppard before your time? Do you know who Def Leppard is? No idea, but I like the name. <laughs> Pour some sugar on me. Legendary. <laughs> Legendary song. Not spelt leopard. Yeah. It's yeah, not spelled a leopard. Not way. spelt Def. I'm it's, so confused. But they're one of the best top... 10 bands in the history of music. Glam glam bands, for sure. Yeah, from the 80s, um, from England. 
Yeah, um, you'd have Iron Maiden, ACDC. Yes. Def Leppard. And then yeah. Def Leppard up there. The, well, know, obviously the Beatles were ahead of them, but... So, um, <laughs> our, Bye. so intern Juan, uh, he verified, <laughs> who said it's better to burn out than fade away? The term is originally from a Neil Young song. The line has been used by Johnny Rotan, and, and I lost the page. But it's from a, it's originally from a Neil Young song. Yeah, yeah. Kurt Cobain like has used it. Def Leppard. Def Neil, Leppard. It's Neil and Young originally from a Neil Young song. Thank yeah. you for that. Good job. Intern Juan. Nice, Tony. Appreciate that. Good How work. How is he going to be an intern for, by the way? Well, he's forever, but he has a normal <laughs> job. Def Leppard coming so, in. I don't pay him. Ooh, so, unfortunately, he only comes when he can. Do you have a normal job? Yeah. <laughs> Who has normal saying. jobs? <laughs> what magic is this? <laughs> what he's like, of? Kurt, you don't pay me. I can only come when I want. I'm, I've always been interested, and we've, we've never really chatted about it, but I've always assumed that there are projects that you are either really close to getting or that you that you were down the wire, something didn't work out. But I know what mine are. I, I've always been interested to ask you, like, what what are those projects that you've been really close in the mix, your, your, your name's in the hat, that you look back on and go, because I've watched a lot of stuff that I've seen, and I'm like, oh, there's no, no, it's not Noah. And I've seen a few of those, and, and I'm interested in, in, in how you feel about that and how you take those losses and, you know, if you chalk them up as like, hey, at least I was in that mix and I'm happy to see, you know, somebody I know go on to, to do well. Or do they really eat at you? I, I was always interested in that. Great question. I love that. Yeah, no, it is a, it is a great question. The, but, and I think we all, you know, there are so many times when you come close, but particularly out here, because you get to you negotiate contracts before you get the job. So you're kind of, you're G'd up and ready to go like a week after it's going to be confirmed or not. And um, so, so those are the ones that I remember. And they were, you know, they were pilots. So they were mm -hmm. pilots for medical shows or this or that. And I don't pay any attention to that. So um, I don't remember the project specifically. Obviously, Game of Thrones was a big one. And everyone would keep coming up, going, "Who are you're just like that guy?" I think there were a couple of guys. Did that you were audition just like, for Game of Thrones? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you yeah, did. Yeah. So it was an early close call, and then and then and then they cast someone who looked like me, but was probably a better actor. Ah. So for what role? So, I guess it was Jamie Lannister. Lannister. Jamie Lannister. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding? That's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's that right there. Fans would be all over you just for that. I auditioned for Jamie Lannister. And just yeah. that alone. Yeah. It is. I mean, but that's what I'm saying. Like, how does that? How does that? Something like that sit with you? Do you? Do you then not watch Game of Thrones because you're like, out of hell with that. I can't watch it. Or do you go? You know what? It's cool to get that close. And I really like the job that he's doing with the role. So I, I cheers. always prefer the books anyway. I mean, I'm, I would always true. go to the books. Person. I'm a really slow reader as well. I'm dyslexic, so mm. audio books probably these days. But uh, but um, yeah, I don't watch a lot of TV. Yeah, I'm just one of those actors. You know, I, I I think that TV, most of the drama that we're doing is representing life. So I try and stay live in life, and not be in every other thing that pulls you out of that. And somehow, obsession with the representation that then becomes the show is doesn't really help with that. Do you, do you try to watch? the things like if you book something and let's say there's a director you're going to be working with or let's say you do book a show that that has a season one or two do you go and watch the season one or two or do you go and watch the directors or watch the actors you're going to work with or do you go in extremely oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, fresh yeah. like i don't yeah. really know who anybody is no no i'm well i mean you, you you're playing a character you're there to play a character I, I just want to do everything that i can to 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 build a layer in the life of the character and that's that's the best you can do and of course there's going to be some stuff about oh who is the person i'm working with and you know where are they coming from and what might they be about but you know it's, it's half the time it's different when you meet them anyway so yeah. you, you you do as much i, I love the research phase of, of what we do it's great but you really you're researching the character that you're being paid to play yeah and i like your answer to what he said and so you recommend if you're close to getting a job and you don't get it why don't let it eat at you just let it go. Walk away because I mean, the only person that hurts is you. And that's for, again, in the end, a lot, a lot of this point of the show is to help people understand the business mm. and understand how to deal with things. And that's one of them. It's like you don't get a, You get close to something. Don't sit there and, like, beat yourself over up over it and let it oh, hit you. I should add a point to that. I mean, I think art mirrors life. Yeah. And sometimes the other way around. But I think art should mirror life. So it should, you should be totally in tune with what it is you're coming into that's mm -hmm. going to work. And... Uh, I'll go back to a little story in our mad family that I grew up in. We had waifs and strays that would arrive at the house. And there was this one guy, Ben, and dad, dad said he worked for MI6, but 
but it turned out he was schiz- <laughs> he, he was schizophrenic. And but I think he could have worked for MI6 too. But he certainly ended up at this point going around the tips in England, getting white goods like fridges and microwaves and Hoovers, and he and he he was kind of pretty amazing. He was a, a physics genius, so he would take these Hoovers and take them apart and turn them into turbos for our go karts and stuff like that. So we were just like this guy's Hoover vacuums, vacuums. Wow, so amazing. He's extraordinary. So wow. at one time when he was not crazy, I said to him, Ben, what what is it that you do? And he went. Uh, there was this big protracted pause he went uh, I'm a freelance human being <laughs> and I was like I don't know what that is but I'm pretty sure that's what I want to be when I grow up <laughs> freelance and I really think that's the best advice for anyone doing anything ever yeah is be a freelance human being first it's so freaking true I like be a human yeah, being we're going to be like that. stealing that quite I, a bit. I'm sorry I'm going to steal that for yeah. the rest of my life because that's, that's how I actually I go through my life but I've never, that's a great term for it. I try to explain it to people and I'm like, I don't get it. Ben but Pollock, if I say a freelance, yeah, slash like people agent. take shit too serious, man. <laughs> yeah. They take it too serious. Yeah. And and that's that's the problem is that a freelance human being, you're able to enjoy life. And when you enjoy life, things are going to come to you anyway because you're happier. And that's, and that's something profound in the being as well. I met someone else later. I met a trance medium later who went into deep trance and he was telling me about stuff, which was kind of amazingly accurate. But he said, dear one, you must remember we are human beings and not human doings. Uh, and I was like, I, yet again, goes back to the root cause of Ben Bonner, espionage agent slash schizophrenic. Wow. You have a lot of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> that is a, a lot of experience. Some incredible experiences. Wow. Mm. So uh, th- th- we have a, a funny similarity. I wanted to go on something that's actually funny. I heard that you broke your nose in the middle of a job. Is this true? I, I wish it was. It's someone broke my nose in the because that happened to me yeah. too. So I want to hear your yeah. story. Yeah, what, what happened? I was working with a young actor who thought he was De Niro and Raging Bull, <laughs> and you know, he didn't listen to anything when the fight coordinator was saying, "Okay, so I want you to take it at half pace. I want you to come up." And very gently, we we're going to go through the camera moves because it's a technical exercise now. And he came out, <laughs> came out, and <laughs> elbow shot up into my nose. It had this really beautiful crack. Oh. You knew yes, it. Yes, I know that um, one. And that sort of eye-watering pain. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were like, "You got, you got to shift it back, mate. You got to shift it back. You got to get your nose straight." And I was like, "Oh, oh I really? Really? Don't really? Move this really? Nose. Just yeah? Really? That's what they said? Yeah." Uh, just keep going. Yeah. And then they went, it looks all right. And I went, <laughs> and blood's coming out. <laughs> like, could you continue the scene? I was like, producers, they're just relentless. Yeah. Mine happened in the middle of a play, actually. I was in the middle of a play and we do this like kind of dance, Oof. choreographed freaking fight scene as well. And one of the actors, same thing, went nuts, hit me. And it was a military play. So I'm bleeding all over stage and, and the the live theater, just- I can't stop. It's not like you can say cut. Like, there's an audience. I had to keep going. Blood's, and I used it because it was military. So, blood's come down. I'm just like using it. That's commitment. And that, and that, what, what else? It can't say stop. I would be like, bring the curtains to get, bring all the curtains down, out. This needs but, to stop. but at the time, you don't really know. Did you really know your nose was bro- broken? You hear the sound and you yeah. feel it. I'd never, and everyone always asked me, like, you know, your nose broke. I want to hear a great story. You got in this great fight or blah, blah. No, it was on stage. Got got it, someone's head hit me in the in the nose, and I didn't know till weeks later that it was broken. Then I went wow. to go see this a surgeon, and he said he looked at me across the room. He said, "Yeah, it's broken. I'm gonna have to re-break it to fix it." Mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh, that's that's amazing." So, and because I same so, thing, yeah, yeah, same thing, same thing. But I did know, and I and I would have I would have let the performance stop in this <laughs> one instance, <laughs> cut because of my inherent narcissism. No, because you know, yeah. So what well would done. you tell like a, a an actor who comes to town? Your first experience was basically going to premieres with with this um, A lister over here, Travis Ooh. Aaron Wade. Yeah. What would you tell an actor who just first came to town? Like when you first get here, this is what you should do. If they're like, "Hey, I want to be an actor, Noah. What should I do? I just got here. What what what, should, what do you recommend to me? Diversify. <laughs> yeah, do something else. Um, are these is this a stock portfolio? I don't know if the motels are as cheap as they were when I arrived. When I was there, I was forty bucks a night, and I thought I can manage this. Yeah. Now they're like a hundred in Hollywood. Yeah. 
That's a motel. Uh-huh. I get a Euro height tent. I get a Euro height tent. I put it up on probably Venice Boulevard under one of the freeways because uh-huh. that seems to be how most people are doing it these days, isn't it? Yeah, I know. exactly. Two years of that. <laughs> and so Noah, he goes back and forth. He spends well, Travis's sofa. In fact, most actors have been on that. Haven't we, they? A lot of. It was it was kind of magical because they would sleep there and then they'd go launch a career. And, and then they so I started sleeping on the sofa. After they slept in it. <laughs> they'd get up in the morning, I'd just lay in it and be like, maybe. Oh, did you have a magic sofa? I had a magic sofa. I mean, oh a lot gosh. of people. I mean, I'll be watching movies and uh, I, I, one of them, uh, Charlie from Stranger Things. Charlie Heaton. Charlie Heaton. I, came, I woke up one morning and a roommate was like, hey, Charlie's on the couch. He has nowhere to sleep. I'm like, who? <laughs> Like this, Charlie's an actor from England. I'm like, all right. And so I walk past, and he's all groggy. And he's like, morning. I'm like, have a good day. You know, a year later, it's Stranger Things kid. I'm like you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Where's that bitch. couch? Yeah, it's, it's so on a Wh- whoever, whoever has it's doing well. That's whoever has it's, it's done. Noah something. slept on it. Taylor <laughs> Kinney slept on it. Uh, James Haybear slept on it. I mean, all. I mean, James Haybear was just in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and I'm watching that, and I'm like, there's James. Ah, that's good now. Maybe he can get his own couch. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's uh, it was it was a pretty roving door with a lot of talent. Before you said you're dyslexic, I'm super dyslexic too. What is your like when you first get a script? And sometimes I find it can sometimes be quite overwhelming when you get like twelve pages, twenty mm. pages, and mm. it's three different scenes, and suddenly you're just all this written word that you have to turn just, into just, story. Yeah. What do, What do you do? Because I have like very specific ways to get around the fact that I can't see the. Yeah, what? I've done some really weird shit. I mean, I feel like um, Russell Crowe in A Perfect Mind. Mm. You're like looking at this jumble of numbers and then sometimes the, these ones kind of, you know, shine out. And 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 then you realise you're emphasising all the wrong words and you shouldn't <laughs> have listened to that at all. But I, but I would do anything to not focus on the script so that, you, you know, the worst thing is it becoming, you're getting really familiar with it and then it becomes, you learn it by rote and then you just don't, can't act anymore. Right. Though there's nothing real about your performance. It has this weird sort of uh, monotone rhythm. And so my thing is, you want to become familiar with it, but you don't want to know it. So it's this weird sort of, sort of uh, intimate relationship you're having with these words and this script. Mm. And you're basically getting into the psychology of the writer. I think that's what you're trying to do, because you're learning their rhythms and their the, what that what it is they're trying to convey. So the emphasis again isn't on the words, but it's the the meaning behind them. But I'll, I'll I remember the strangest thing I used to do was cut up the cut up the scene into lines. I put all the lines in a hat or a bowl or whatever. Wow. And then I pull the lines out at random and go, where, where would a line like that ever go in an exchange? And I go, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Oh, my god! I go, oh, because That's so somewhere fun. near wow. the bottom. That's so fun. And pull out another one. I go, probably somewhere in the middle, somewhere near the top. And then, and then I, but I become really familiar with those lines. So I would know those lines. I just wouldn't know why. Wow. And then when I came to put them together, it was But that easy. process That's is intense. I mean, it's already hard enough as actors to learn all the dialogue when we don't have dyslexia. Like, I, I don't envy. That seems so tough because... Acting 101 is don't learn lines by rote. Don't memorize them. Don't do this. But you guys kind of have to go down that kind path have to. to a point. I, my, I guess, obviously, over the last four years, I've lived with a lot of actors. You tape a lot of actors, blah, blah, blah. And especially in pilot season when you've got maybe three, four in a week and <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy busy and you've got different accents and different, like, whatever. Most people I know just have their script. And they either go into the room reading off the script pretty much or they do a tape with the script and they're just kind of flicking through it and they do it. But for us, I don't know if yours is the same, but if I'm in the middle of a scene and I look down to try and find my place, it just looks like a bunch of ants have gone nuts on some honey a on page. So yeah. there is nothing I That's can do. Incredible. So I have to know it. That's incredible. There's no such thing as me walking into a room. I'll have my script in my hand, but it's just to get the first line. Because if I try and look in the middle of the scene, it's done. I'm That I'm makes out. me think every actor who doesn't have to deal with that should never complain again. <laughs> no. Like well, you can't be lazy when you're dyslexic with a script. You just have to know it. Mm. So but it's a lot, right? That's like, intense. I had an eight page monologue yesterday to do in room. Had to know the whole thing from yeah. start to finish. Yeah. I mean, personally, I do what Travis taught me because I remember once I, I had an audition the next day and I was I called Travis. And I was like, can you coach me? I'm freaking out. I've got like all these lines to learn tomorrow and I 
got so much on today with another audition and he goes I'll have it with you in like two minutes and I was like whatever <laughs> went over and he had me down quickly and it was read it but then he was saying tell me like he would read it to me and then he was like tell me the story that you just heard and that being dyslexic was like mind-blowingly just incredible because that's now how I learn a script just mm-hmm being either someone reading it to me or me reading it and then just regurgitating the story. So at least I know roughly what my story is that I have That's to interesting because that's kind of how I approach things too, not being dyslexic. I kind of learn what it's about and then I just regurgitate the story because I don't want to have to learn the lines. I don't want to have to see the words and learn the lines. I just want to know what I'm saying. A lot of times I won't say the words exactly like they're on the page, but you're still getting the point across and telling the story. And that's kind of what it sounds like what you guys... Yeah, I think that's yeah. what you're doing with the chopping up, right? Well, yeah. yeah, and actually with a fusion of those both approaches, often it will be keywords. You say, mm. this is just a jumble of ants in having a rave on this piece of paper. <laughs> that's not helpful to me. But if I have a keyword that I underline, that I highlight, I, you can't. then I can see the highlighter. If I highlight all the lines, it just becomes ants on acid. On a a piece of paper. See, I started getting a blank piece of paper and just writing out all my lines, ignoring everything else on the page. I write down all my lines and then I do that. I grab a pink highlighter because being dyslexic, I don't know if you have a color, but if mine's highlighted in orange, green or yellow, can't see it. It's not there. Yellow's bad. Yeah, yellow is terrible for (laughs) dyslexic. Blue or pink, it works. But I'll highlight that key word. Yeah, or or the lilac one, the the calm colors. I I think a lot of it's... Lilac. Yeah, I just think the past the pastely <laughs> highlighters that they do now. Are, so what wait, color oh, is actually yeah. lilac though? Um, what color is it? What, what primary color is lilac? Well, isn't it like it's violet like purple, on the yeah. Roy Gabov <laughs> scheme of colors? There's spectrum? another word that growing up here in the states I never was. What, Roy Gabov? Lilac. lilac. Oh, lilac. It's a great okay. word. Jeff it's Buckley. It's an awesome word. Lilac. Wine. I'm gonna work with textile lilac textiles while I'm weaving. I think I work. <laughs> What if you do have and to having be triplets. word specific though? Because there's some TV shows, especially comedies, where they will literally pull you up for a where instead of a what or whatever. Like that's a stupid but, example. But I think we worry about that more because we know that would be the thing that we'd fall short on. And like getting to improvisation is so much about being able to get there and then go actually let go of all that. How often for you guys then? Because a lot of times, especially on TV, script supervisors are like literally you miss that word. Between takes, they're like, um, Jade, Noah, uh, make sure you say this word. Do they do that a lot with you guys? Uh, <laughs> make sure you say this word right there. I mean, yeah, I get that all the time. Yeah, I, mean, so I like to know, just you, kind of flow yeah, 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 and yeah. not stick to the words because it makes me feel too robotic. Yeah. And I get it. Yeah. So do you guys get that it a lot? Is, you know what it's like. You, you choose your battles. Exactly. You, know? you want to be as good as you can so that you can, you can do something different and that yeah. be okay. You have to earn it. Yes, but you also don't want to piss them off. But you right. also need to give your performance too. Yeah. And it, it could actually constrict your work if you're so worried about, oh, I have to get this word that they said here. But I don't know about you. I would, I would always be like, I've got to be able to do this in a typhoon with the house spinning. And, you know, I ba- because there's always going to be like a grip or there's going to be a, a, a spark kind of running through set. just And then suddenly someone shouts action. And the, the thing that's right. so disruptive, I don't think it's dyslexia specific, but it's so disruptive is that's your... You're, you're sensitive to energy. Mm-hmm. You're picking up on this mad energy going on, which is all just practical. Mm-hmm. And someone goes, do your brilliant performance. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't get, like, give me a minute. In fact, give me 10 minutes. In fact, what's all this noise? <laughs> yeah. And for everybody listening who hasn't been on set that much or worked that much, he's what he said is right. There's so much noise all around you. And you as an actor have to learn how to literally drown it out. You cannot let it affect you at all because you've just got to focus in and dial on the task at hand and that's whatever you're doing in that scene right there because there's noise at 360 there's people all angles doing something doing some moving stuff talking doing this well that's why i've i've really focused on especially with people i'm working with meditation which i never incorporated in 20 years of acting wish i could go back and do it but to drop down and to meditate meditate on the material meditate on the lines and then put yourself in a bubble which is what I tell everyone. I think I've told you that multiple times, like put yourself into a bubble. And the way you achieve that is through meditation. And if I can go back and I could learn to meditate prior to anything I'd ever done, auditioning, being ready on set, and learn to block out that noise and then almost come to set in a meditative state, Mm -hmm. it probably would have made a big difference in my Mm -hmm. career. I'm pretty sure of it. Um, Mm -hmm. But that's what I teach now. When I work with people, Mm -hmm. I just say, put yourself in the bubble. If you don't know how to get there, let's let's go through a 20-minute warrior meditation. 
And then when they get out of that meditation, open their eyes, they have their lines down. They have their, they have everything down. They're just like in it. And then by the time you're like, let's finish up, let's wrap up. They're like, what did I just do? Cause they're in this, this real magical place. It's pretty special. So I, I, I really hope that more people learn to meditate. What Travis is saying is very true. And that works for auditioning too. I mean, I started doing that years ago cause you can be in an audition room with all these guys, your type, all these girls, your type. And everybody, one person's flipping pages. They're all nervous. The other one's trying to talk to people. Someone else is doing this and moving. And it's a lot of chaotic energy. Mm-hmm. So if you just sit there and you just breathe, like tr- it, it works so well. Just breathe and just be in your own space and don't worry about anything and just trust. <laughs> and people freaks and, out the other actors. Oh, like, it why, does. Why are they so calm? <laughs> no, it does. It, people and will alone. I was actually going to do that, and it does a mind game on the other one because it, does. it so does. But that's part of it. That's part of the game. That's part of the game. Fuck with their heads. That was my audition yesterday. I walked in, <laughs> put my bag down, put my script down, and just stood up. <sighs> No, around. we're giving away <laughs> trade secrets here, but that's so true. Yeah. Part of the game, and again, it could sound shoddy, but you walk in a room, part shoddy of it, it sounds. <laughs> is is messing with the other people. Yeah, that so happens wrong. a lot. But it's so wrong. So, no, it's like so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that is not a, cricket. So it's a t- as we as we, this is a tough business from work, learning lines to dealing with divas to all this stuff. What do you do personally to kind of like regenerate yourself and kind of like reprogram? And we were talking about earlier is it's important, like you were saying, leave town right. or do find something well, so to you that you can refresh everything. Well, listen, for me, it's nature. I mean, I yes. think we're, we're all yes. in these urban places now and we're all on phones and all of those things are square waves. They're electrical square waves and you get rounded sine waves in nature. So go to nature. Sorry, uh, I'm just laughing because well, last well, time. Because well, we were talking about <laughs> hugging trees. Okay. I, okay. So because she started her day that day by hugging a tree. Yeah. Literally in veterans. Literally. They always scratch me. <laughs> I, I'm, I must no, be but I'm a self-proclaimed trees. tree hugger. I'm, I'm all about nature. And L.A. is my antithesis. I grew up in Northern California, which is all, it's a redwood oh, forest. Yeah. Yep. I ran through creeks and, and forests my whole life. And I come to L.A. and there's nothing here. There's Desert. nothing. Like people yeah. are like, "Hey, go hike at Fryman or Runyon." I'm like, "Dude, there's brush, there's bushes, like little shrubs. That's not nature, dude." And but that's it. You have to connect with nature. The closest thing we actually have is the ocean. How's your relationship yeah. with your agents and managers? How did that begin? Have you changed them a lot? Do you have your person? Um, yeah. I mean, I when I I left home at 17, and I I sort of had this. I literally had a voice in my head saying, "It's time to leave now." You're going. Your family now is the now the world at large, mm. Mm. and I think it's probably quite hard on my family. But I, I kind of, you know, I, I felt like I was on the path, and I was origi- I was early on in my early twenties with a big agency, and they put in some effort up front, and then they kind of sat back, and I was like, I'm in my early twenties. Th- I, I, I went to this shitty little drama school. I, I need to work to learn. You know, experience is everything. And they kind of sit back and go, oh, you know, we'll deal with every other client. Because they look after 40 clients. You think mm. you're the only one and you're just not. So it's kind of, you you got to play the game. And I was, I was, I, you know, I was hungry and ambitious and impatient and all the things that you should be when you're that age. And so I did 28 Days Later and then I left and thought, I'm not being with a big agency anymore. That's, that's, that's like joining the institution that I've never been comfortably part of anyway. So I went to boutique agencies. About four of them spent. You have to spend a year or two to really see if they can do what they claim mm-hmm. they're going to do, and they couldn't. And it was devastating because I spent most of my twenties going, "This is just not working." I always worked. It just didn't have. It wasn't sustaining in the way that I think it should have. Mm. Um, and that you know, and you never blame anyone. You can't blame anyone in the industry, even if you could or wanted to, because you know, uh, you know, then you're just the guy who moans. So, but I did, I kind of realized like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And maybe this is advice to other people. I was like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. At that point, I got a voiceover agent and I got a commercials agent and I got an acting agent and then I got a modeling agent in New York and I got a 10 other modeling agents and acting agents in America and England. And suddenly having 20 agents was, of course, the phone never stopped ringing. Mm. And everyone else was going, well, you know, loyalty and everything. I'm like, this... I, to, to reiterate the, the thing a producer said to me on Mists of Avalon in 2001, we were making, moaning about how some scene should be. And he came up to me and said, no, you need to understand this is show business, not show art. And I was like, 
what show art <laughs> show art that isn't a word <laughs> but what he was basically trying to say is i'm making money out of this and your fucking questions about creative things <laughs> is really getting in the way of it <laughs> that's, why, but I, that's why you're paying me to do creative <laughs> to things show you, exactly. make money. you know so it was, a, it was this yeah. weird thing but at some point you've got to have a producer's mentality even mm. if you're not going to be a producer and realize that that's what's paying for you to do that's what true you do but unfortunate because we just love to be artists and just create and be it use there's, our imagination no such thing you know there isn't we, you, you know there's no one without the other and for those really listening know. that's so true it took me years to understand this is a business in the end and you have to understand how to play the game mm. and be part of it mm. you can fight it as much as you want i'm an artist i'm a thespian i'm just going to create no you have to kind of fuse and understand how to work with it cohesively mm. And it's not like as an act, I mean, I don't know, yeah, it, I, I think of a lot of artist artists um, who are doing work are, will often have posthumous success and mm-hmm. wealth, you know, a great artist um, have posthumous wealth. How, use, how useless is that? Or is that amazing? I don't know. It's don't great know. for their, their kids. But yeah, hard for an actor to do that. <laughs> like, w- were you on the celluloid or not? Yeah, exa- exactly. Um, and that's what the name of the show is. It's called What's Your Name Again? So it's like, it's all about, were you, did you do this? Were you once relevant? Are you ever going to be relevant? Mm-hmm. Were you up on the screen? It's like, how do you feel that that per, that works with, with you? Like, do you do you have people come up to you and say, hey... I recognize you from somewhere. What's your name again? Like, yeah, I love that. I call it the 10 second rule. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. You, you see the recognition and then you run the other way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but don't, don't, more than 10 seconds, they'll have you in a neck hold. Yeah. And they'll be quizzing you on your life and, and what. And they want to take selfies with you, take pictures with you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's just, there's so many, there's so many things you can say to an artist that are, that are highly offensive that they don't know. They don't understand. But God, you look like that guy from Game of Thrones. Like, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. I'm yeah. not, by yeah. the way. Or, or I didn't like you in that thing. Or you were, you were really. Like, oh, oh, I get. Yeah. I get a, that all the time. Travis has a sore spot. Yeah. I do, Jeremy well, yeah, Renner. Jeremy Renner. Yeah, Jeremy. <laughs> oh really, God, like you look so <laughs> yeah. much like Jeremy oh, Renner. I'm like, God. my bank account doesn't look like Jeremy Renner's bank account. <laughs> oh my God. Um, or where do I know you from? What's you know, like your name you again? What's your name again? That's it's what like, it is. Well, then obviously, you know, I'm not. I'm not anybody special. You know, that's like what your mind says, but. Truthfully, like there's just these triggers that you look like so and so. What's your name? Have I seen you yeah. in something? And it's like, well, and they don't, don't they know. don't get it. They don't get it. And that's why you can't even get mad at them. I usually <laughs> say, yeah, I would like if it's a restaurant. Like we were recently, I was just in New York and we, we were at a restaurant at a cafe, and this person came up to me and a director friend of mine, and said, um, "Where do I know you from?" And I go, "Well, I was here yesterday." <laughs> he goes, "Oh." <laughs> And he, and we just kind of walked walked away. Now I don't know if he was there yesterday, but we really were. We were at the same cafe. We went yeah. back to back. But he was like, "Where do I know you from?" I was like, "Well, I was here yesterday." And he goes, "Oh, yeah." And I just we just left. But it was like he, you could see him stuck in his. He brain. probably thought you were Jeremy <laughs> Renner. Yeah, he probably, but he could see him going like. Was but I, I wasn't here yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but was I here? Yeah, I don't know. But good. I was here yesterday. <laughs> Aren't you Jason Bourne? Didn't yeah. I see you in the Bourne Identity? Yeah, I was there yesterday. Yeah, yeah these ke- clever sabotage things that these American <laughs> actors have, like they'll just fuck you up one way or another. I just run. <laughs> you just like run. ten yeah. second no, rule. Just run. Six, seven, run. <laughs> run I know, run. right? You we're thinking too much. You're just like I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Yeah, we're just sitting and there. I think pondering. It, it, the in England, like it's. The, in England, in the English, uh, very much like Australians, and it's kind of uh, that whole you don't want to talk about yourself. It's the tall poppy syndrome. We hate talking mm. about ourselves. And mm. the worst thing, when I first came here, I don't know if you had this as well, but it was like you had to learn to say why you're mm. amazing mm. because it's just not something that we do. Whereas, mm. especially in LA, not these fantastic humans, but a lot of people walk into a room and the first thing they do is what they've done. They list their resume and tell you all the reasons why you're amazing. Oh my God. Yeah. How hard do you find that here? Mm. Cause we don't do that. It's not in our culture. No, no, you're It's right. like, I'm really crap at everything. Yeah. These are the reasons why. Yeah. And they're like, okay, great. Hi. <laughs> so I had to learn to not do that anymore. Is that like a thing for you here? But it's really hard. Yeah. I mean, I think if you spend long enough here, you start to get, you feel comfortable about talking about yourself you know that's that's one thing i still after 20 years cannot i'm uncomfortable someone says what do you do what do you do mm-hmm. i literally say i just hang out well i i, I can what's, what new, I what's the new term he said the new term you're a human being or well, uh-huh. freelance human oh we already being. Feel a freelance human, human being. being oh my god yeah you gotta write that please share you should, that. You should just yeah. go in and resonate yeah. yeah i'm a freelance human being um, that can be the name of this but, episode but that's <laughs> the thing is um, noah huntley 
I'm going to name that Freelance this episode human. that. Okay, great. But that's Perfect. the thing is, I love it. it. I think it's personality too for that mm. because I've never been comfortable. I cannot talk about myself. I don't like to talk about it. And that's why I always just say, and you're right. Everybody's like, what do you do? That happened to me three times last night in an event. First thing, hey, what do you do? Seriously, like that's such an American thing to do. Because yeah. my mom's not from the States. And she told me early on, she said, why do Americans do that? You guys always just ask, what do you do? That In other countries, that's considered rude. Yeah, it's like, yeah. what's that, your age to a lady? Exactly. Yeah. What do you do? It's like asking how many dollars in your bank account. Yes. Like, yeah, why does what? it matter? <laughs> Don't you want to get to know me no. for who I am? No. Like, what does it matter what I do? Yeah. And then, like, this one girl last night, she's like, what do you do? I'm like, this is what I do. And she's all, oh, elaborate on that a little bit more. What What do you do in that? And, that like, and then I started seeing, oh, she's trying to see how many dollar signs I got. Uh -huh. Like, literally, that's what it was. Yeah. And I'm like, this, I walked to, I was like, it was nice meeting you. I'm out. And it's, it's, it's so superficial. So it's not only just you guys, it's just people in general. We have to deal with that mm -hmm. in, in here. Well, and it's also this town, you know, this town's strange because it has so many people coming through that won't be here in three months, exactly. or three years, or however long the visa Absolutely. lasts. You know, so everyone's coming for something. So there's this expectation that you need to sell yourself so that you can be on the, the, the map. So speaking of which, you got to a place that I wanted to ask you, what is the major difference, first thing that pops in your head between England and America the the, is what? The Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> but the we're, thing not, is, we're not geographic. But the thing is, we're very similar because the United States basically was founded from freaking British people. Right. You know, so mm. are we really that different? No, I don't, I don't think so. No, I, I think, think so. all Americans are fundamentally European. E yeah. e exactly, because we're all kind of spawned from the... Sort of. I mean, kind <laughs> well, of. There's some guys on horseback, though, as well. <laughs> Didn't they come from Siberia? Or not? Oh, yeah, they came from the other do side, you, too. Do you prefer New York or California for, for the I, arts? I, I think they have to coexist. I think, yeah. I think essentially California gets quite gloopy, and I feel like it like sprinkles on my coffee. And <laughs> so then, there's the accent. And, you you know, did it. New York, you did, we got it. it out of you. We got, got it. it. We got what, it. what do you want? Yeah, yeah. Two more, two more. So do you do you feel sort of cerebrally cerebral on the east coast and kind of heart cerebral? cerebral yeah cerebral. cerebral cerebral do you feel like with the pop up in Atlanta and obviously Vancouver and the expanding the expanding work uh, opportunities in those states that mm. you're like maybe I'll go spend some time in Louisiana maybe I'll also go spend some time in Atlanta maybe I'll go Make, try to get my Canadian residence can, and spend some time in Vancouver because there's so many productions really there now. I really wanted to go to Vancouver. Being a freelance yeah. human being, yeah. does that is that something that you really think about going like, oh, California, like I come here, I get it. I know what I do. I catch up with old friends. I maybe meet up with some individuals. And well, when I was obsessed with global domination, I, I thought, <laughs> I, I, I thought, yeah, it would be good to have a... That's uh, what it sounded yeah, like. you know why we're friends. <laughs> it would be good to have a home in England and LA and then Sydney. And I thought yeah. that's pretty much covers the globe then. You could know, get everywhere in about six hours from any one of those those spots. And I was traveling a lot over the last, you know, between 2010 and 17, I was traveling a flight a week for about seven years. That's crazy. And I was going all over the world and I thought, well, I'm kind of, I genuinely am a global citizen now. I know because I have yeah. no friends. And um, I thought if I go to, if I, you know, I have, I have, these are my, you know, those could be homes and I could be global. And, uh, so so that's kind of the way I was thinking more than should I go to Louisiana or should I go to Vancouver? I was like, how do I how do I get the best experience from planet Earth? This well, moment? Jade already did that. Mm. So she she grew up. She was born in France, but grew up in Italy, but was raised in Australia. But now she's American. Yeah, so you yeah. The only thing that's left is like Canada. You might be well, I was going to move child. to Vancouver, yeah. but uh, yeah, I've got a lot of passports, a lot of a green card. And, but, but in the end, it's only a base. That's the reality. I mean. I think it's going to become more important. I think travel is going to get heavily taxed and we're not going to be able to run around as amazingly as we have through mm. our generation. But I think, um, so I think that's something to bear in yeah. mind. Right. But I we're mean, global citizens. Too. Absolutely. We've I mean, it's I, I, probably the same for all of us. You go where the work is. You know, I, I don't feel like actors are very tied to any particular space because you want to be constantly moving because you want to be working or get tied yeah. into a six-year contract and be wherever that is. But like... Mm. We're very malleable. Well, and we think, crave that, too, yeah. because that just makes you a better artist. It's funny. I'm kind of hoping that in the next month I don't move into any home because I go somewhere yeah. else to film. <laughs> like, that's... Like, we want... Yeah. This is... We want... We don't want to sit in a cubicle, basically. No. We want to get out there and see as much as possible and experience the world. 
and life. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. I don't know. There's a part no of bands, me that exactly. feels like we should be in like shitty little theatres in in some grotty part of London. That's I, probably. I actually. did that in LA my yeah. first ten years here. <laughs> shitty little theatres. And trust me, it's not the way to roll. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the most? I asked. I started this with Jade, and I kind of liked how she answered it. And I want to kind of keep this going. No pressure. What is the most att- attractive thing about Los Angeles culture to you? Uh, live and let live. And what's the most unattractive thing about Los Angeles culture? Pick ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, elaborate on that. I, you know, just this. This is the like capital of glamour. And yes. I think the problem with glamour is it's a massive illusion and delusion. Exactly. And so it's like the worst of fantasy. Fantasy should be liberating and expansive and delusion is when you've gone too far. It, and I think true. people get delusional. They, uh, there you go. That's it. Or all of these things. So you just, I think probably back to Travis's thing, stay rooted, uh-huh. stay centered, meditate, realize this is all temporary. Mm. Uh, exactly. Uh, right. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, found, I saw somewhere and, you know, you could... Do a little bit if you can or can't. But I heard you kind of know your way around the harmonica. Did you see one sitting here on the table? <laughs> Did you see one sitting here on the table? Oh, dear. Look, so just Stay so you now. know, I disinfected it and cleaned it and that, like went nuts hilarious. on it. I haven't played the harmonica for about 20 So if you even know how to do anything on it, would you mind doing it for us? Because that's like something I think is amazing. Though I think I we will all... Look- <laughs> <laughs> just if you, even if you can't I can just play blowing it like it. a note blowing it I love that <laughs> <laughs> if it goes something like that it would be like old McDonald had a mom let's do no alright that's amazing <laughs> that's a first sound. it's a beautiful, sound. Awesome. It's a a beautiful first. sound it's a gorgeous so sound. what What? when you did play it back in the day like you just picked one up I liked it on the farm that literally that kind of that sound reminded me I think it was a film with Tony Curtis isn't it? Yeah. I don't know what film it is but he was playing a cowboy and they just have this dusk uh, scene and there's that harmonica is all that you hear and I think there's a pot of coffee it's growing such somewhere. A n- it's such a, a nostalgic feel like a it makes you just really think and f- so now this is where I ask you a few questions that just kind of like I'm going to pound them out just first thing that jumps okay. mm-hmm. in your head is uh, top three bands for you in the history of the world <laughs> oh my god I don't even know bands. I just think of people like Billy Holiday, Aretha Franklin. That, that's like it. You're saying it. Away and then so Billy Holiday, Aretha, Aretha Franklin, Franklin, and... I really like a band called Osric Tentacles we used to live, listen to at school. Osric Tentacles? Mm, check them out. In my oh, okay. Life. That's interesting. And so speaking of that, then what's one song that would be, you would consider like your life's anthem that just forever that will I carry can't through? I just throw this out. I <laughs> just throw it out. I just throw it out. Playlist and Come on. Alexa and all the other... I'm sexy shit, or... Um, time. <laughs> Too sexy for my shirt. Um, uh, no, well, I'm just thinking now because I said Billy Holiday. I'll probably go with Summertime or something. That's good. The, there you go. Summer, summer, summer. Summertime. That one? Not that one. No, <laughs> not, not the Will Summertime. Smith one? <laughs> the Will Smith one. <laughs> <laughs> the Will Smith one was great. Um, and what is one song then? Because I, I think music tells a lot about people. So what's one song that no one will ever hear you listen to, though, that in private... It's your like dirty little secret that you'll listen to in the shower, or in your room, or at home. <laughs> cool. Some like Taylor Swift or something. Is this where you came on stuck? Is this where your managers oh, are like, I... you can't go on that show again <laughs> ever? <laughs> yeah. I actually was terrible at these. I couldn't. Yeah, I, couldn't... I, I mind wipe when it gets I, to. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a dyslexic thing. Yeah. But like, that's it's the great. Not to go there. <laughs> but that's the greatest thing is because the people don't have a chance to think about it and it's organic. It's like yeah. like what, what I don't. Know, I feel like Neil Young or Van Morrison would probably come in there. I love it. It's one amazing. Of my, one of my private. Idaho's and then the final music related one what is one song that like if you're working out or you just need to get in that kick ass mode that like freaking just pumps you up like, if I need to do you? that I just don't listen to music no music M- any oh, wow. distraction to me is not helpful oh wow that's interesting yeah. okay yeah. that's that's a good answer uh, what's one book or play a book because you like to read yeah that's going to be in your back pocket the rest of your life well, I one of the most affecting books to me was a little book, thank God, a little skinny book called Rogue Mail by Jeffrey Household. And they did a film with Peter O'Toole in it. And it's, uh, 
I think it's a great book. It's the basis of a lot of espionage stories. Uh-huh. And uh, that's always been a, a little fond favorite of mine. And you said a little book is going to fit in your pocket. Well, it's, yeah, well, it's, it's not a post Oh, it's not stamp. a big it's read. Not, it's not but Harry it's, Potter. Uh, it's not too many pages. Oh, but it's not Harry Potter. Nine and three quarters, is that what it is? It's Someone's that... tattoo. <laughs> but what I love about I Harry Potter is Stephen Fry doing the audiobooks because he does yeah. such a great job of those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, there we go. There's the answer to your question. And then what's what's one the, your favorite hobby to do? That's just one hobby that people would know about. You just enjoy doing. It could be anything. Keep it clean. Yeah, no, exactly. You're from Sussex. I'm like, I take stuff about. It's or are people from Sussex it, dirty? Probably. I. Yes. I uh, it's probably bikes. You know, I used to race motocross bikes. I like. Like, I like, like engineering. Motorcycles or like uh, BMX. Motorcycles. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so do you still so, get to ride at any at any point? Well, I had a huge accident when I was 15, so I, that put me off a bit. But I, I, Bell Staff came forward, so we want to make you the face of Bell Staff, and we went out to Salt Lake City. Uh, was it sort of Utah anyway? We wow, yeah, Salt Lake City. There, and we were we were sh- racing around on Triumph. Uh, to Those Alpha tracks, Fly. doing going off the tabletops and jump, doing no, the jumps. No, it, it was flat. They were doing the land speed record there for the for two wheels, which is like four hundred miles an hour. They were trying to get with rocket bikes. What a great campaign to be a but, part yeah. of! Wow, Bell Staff cool. is classy, man. Yeah, That's yeah, it's a classy shoot. That's awesome. And the final thing is, which I always I feel like you can learn a lot from somebody, and you guys are going to start doing this now. If you go to the grocery store and you're waiting in line to buy something, if you look in someone's basket or you see what they're you're grabbing, you can learn a lot about somebody. What are the top three things I would find in your grocery cart at the store? Oh, God. Which store, for one thing? Um, Trader I, Joe's. I, I'd always have bananas. I just have to have those. I'm vegetarian, so uh-huh. like, I've got to have a fast go-to. Uh-huh. Um, I've got to have bananas. Uh what else? I probably want to like do spirulina or something. Just have something that was just going to be like amazing. <laughs> that put sounds on so Hollywood. Banana, spirulina, yeah. and, and chia seeds. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, probably eggs. Oh, hey, isn't that what you said? Yeah, there's yeah. always eggs. Eggs, <laughs> coffee, some protein. Stuff. Protein. protein. That's the protein because there's Fast no meat. Protein. Yeah. So you can cheat with the eggs. Yeah. I like that. So banana, spirulina, and eggs sounds like an amazing diet. Throw it all in a blender. And yeah, you've got I'm not your saying meal. it's the ideal diet, but you said I got to quick fire it. So there you go. That's what good I got job. That's basket. amazing. I didn't mean to like fluster you. Your <laughs> no, hair, no. look, your hair got all. <laughs> look at that. His hair just went. Poop. <laughs> Same thing happened to Jay. She started getting all flushed, and she just, she couldn't talk. I'm like, this is great though. Throw you off guard. Lucuma powder. Did they do lucuma powder? What's lucuma powder? Oh. Well, Let's hear about that we'll one. Talk later. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> Does that have health benefits? I want to hear. It. We'll but I just I I I've, I watched this show for five years, and every yeah. every year I've been like, where the hell is Noah? Why is he not no- on this show? Noah Cornelius something Huntley. 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 What is yeah. it? Yeah, Marmaduke. You see me, you Marmaduke. See me as classy. Marmaduke. I do. See, I actually do see you as yeah. classy. And then I end up on the Royals and, <laughs> and realize I'm trashy. <laughs> Wasn't Marmaduke? Just get, uh, that, uh, just get it wrong. A know? cartoon character. Marmaduke, Marmaduke was a cat, right? I think he was a cat at some point. And yeah. He, my dad published a book where he was a giraffe. So I don't. Oh, yeah. so. Not the long neck. Well, if you had your ideal That's genre to work in as an actor, like the rest of your life, they said you're on this series till you die. What would it be? Speaking of, he's speaking of the crown. Would it be? That I just of- never had that period drama. I wish mm-hmm. I had. Uh, but it, the thing that I've always loved is sci-fi. Yes. And there's so. Yes. I think I love sci-fi because I feel like you can seed new consciousness into yeah. a kind of you know, uh, you know, a, an audience that are open. And, and you can actually use your imagination yeah. and and be creative. Like you do a, a, a show like CSI or like. All these shows, you have to stick to reality, and yeah. you're only and have it's bit- procedural. It's institutionalized exactly. in some way. So, Whereas sci-fi or fantasy, you can go as far out as you want. There's yeah. no rules. Yeah. And you can just be free. You know, you could be that freelance human being as Noah Huntley is. Thank you, Noah Huntley, for coming Thank on the show you. for What's Your Name Again. We appreciate it. That was freaking awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Very cool. Jade Albany Piatrantino. Let's hear it. You didn't get to sit here. You want my full name? I want, I want uh, yeah, the full name. Jade Maria Celeste Albani Piatrantino. Oh, my God. It's like Princess Bride. Isn't it? <laughs> right, it's just. Uh, and Travis, what's your name again? Travis Aaron Wade. <laughs> Let's hear the accent though. Travis Aaron Wade. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Mike Peebler in the house. Thank you for coming to check it out. We have Intern Juan. Thank you for running the show. 
I'm Kirk Caceres on What's Your Name Again. This is Jason Charles Miller on the music. And that's it. Good night. Good night. Bye. Nice. All right, guys. Well done. Good job, dude. Woo! Thank you very much. God, it's you're in the hot seat. I'm hot here.